I'm, I'm very interested in research, but I'm really more interested in it in terms of how can it inform practice. And once you do decide what you think is the best thing to do, how, how do you spend the time and effort and handle the complexities that are involved in actually implementing things and making certain that they work? But when I set out to do the work on media, the question I asked was, what media are going to make more difference for learning than others? Or what kind of learning is facilitated by which different kind of which medium? And what kind of people work better with which kind of media for which kinds of learning outcomes? So that was really the first question that, that, that really intrigued me. I had been a, a television director. I'd been a film director. Um, I taught actually taught courses in the history of the cinema and so on. Dick Snow, who since has died, but Snow was a psychologist and he was very interested in this aptitude treatment interaction stuff. And he was the only person in education at Stanford at that time who was interested in technology also. And, uh, but he had this good idea, I mean he had a, a good approach to it. And so he was always challenging me. He was probably the reason why I sat down and did that study that resulted in the article about uh, that, that media don't make a difference to learning. It's they make a difference in cost or time, but not learning. And uh, the grocery truck analogy, which by the way, I took from one of my graduate students. And that analogy is what people remember. A lot of people have not read the article. It's a legion, but very few people have not heard the analogy. A week after that article appeared in, uh, in the journal, the president of Harvard was interviewed and used the analogy. He had read the article and used the analogy as the reason why he wasn't going to support the purchasing of computers for the faculty at Harvard. Which is not a very appropriate interpretation of the article, actually. So uh, the reason why I have misgivings about it is not because I got hate mail afterwards, and I did. I can't tell you how many letters I received that said I was going to, I was taking food out of people's kids' mouths and so on and so forth with this. They're going to let me go, you know. They're going to fire me. And uh, while we can argue a lot about what features of instruction make a difference in learning, and there are people now that argue that instruction doesn't matter. I mean, the instructivist, constructivist thing makes me crazy, but there really are people out there in our field who say that instruction is not the solution. The temptation is to find a, a solution and go try to find a problem that it will solve. I'm going to full stop there just for a second because I think that's a, a, to me that was a mind-bending insight when I had it. Uh, if you look at the world and if you look at our field and you ask yourself what's going on, you'll find out what's going on is that people are trying to sell solutions to other people. I think we too quickly forget, particularly in, in instructional technology, educational technology, that what we're about is learning. We're not about technology, we're not about machines, we're not about social media, we're not about whatever the newest gimmick is that's out there. We're out what makes a difference in the learning of people at all ages, all stages, and all contexts. I have an argument with McLuhan, obviously, I, that's what I, one of the people I start out to argue with, and I don't think the medium was the message. But I think he understood that most people think the medium is the message. Why? Because it's in front of your face. It's obvious, and it's a, it's a very compelling experience. But it turns out that media itself is not what happens. It's what's on the medium that makes a difference. That's what we have to be concerned about. And yet, it's mastering the mechanism of the technology that is most fr up in front and, and most obvious. What's not obvious is the hidden stuff, which is the design of what's in all those wonderful media experiences that you have. Who did that? Who wrote that script? Who developed that storyboard? What's the hidden, completely sexless kind of undergirding structure that's there that's connected somehow with my, my cognition and has had this huge impact on me? That's the question we have to answer. The adulation that we give to actors, and even secondarily to directors, and not to the screenwriters that made it all happen. We are the screenwriters of education, and we've got to find a way to get people to respect our craft and our science and our technology. And in my view, I've tried hard to, uh, for example, to get people to be really clear about what they mean by any treatment that they think influences learning, 
And why? What's their explanation for why that particular treatment, that particular intervention, method, call it whatever you wish, should actually have an influence on learning, should have, should have led to whatever variance you noticed in the outcome of a learning study? I mean, half the journal articles I read, half, more than half, three quarters of the journal articles I read, I have no idea what the intervention was. I mean, I understand what person says it, it was. Pick almost anything. Uh, people advocate today things like problem-based learning. Well, it's a great idea, problem-based learning. The problem is there's like 50 different definitions of what, or operational definitions, exactly what problem-based learning is. And that includes people whose definition was at one point three or four years ago, but it's changed now, but they're still calling it by the same name. How do you have a dialogue when you can't define the terms that you're having a dialogue about? Um, it, it's serious games. This, there's this fascination with electronic games is because kids and adults are intrigued by them, so let's use them for education. Nobody has yet defined, operationally defined, what a learning game is, what a serious game is. The military had a big conference on this a few years ago, a few, just two years ago now, and they brought in a lot of top people and uh, names that everybody would recognize in games and educational research and said, we want you to do two things. We want you to define what a, they call it a serious game is, and secondly, we want to tell you, we want you to sort of try to agree on what are the elements of an effective learning game or serious game. After two days, this group had not agreed on the definition of a game. And I think that fairly characterizes the whole field of instructional technology and even, I'd go even further, to educational research. I don't think we can advance until we challenge each other to be precise, as precise about treatments as we are about the way we measure learning. We have this tradition of being concerned about reliability and different kinds of validity in our dependent measures in research. We have no tradition about being as clear and as operational and as precise about the treatments that we develop. And that makes it almost impossible to interpret the results of educational research. So who's being served by that, I ask myself. My guess is if this video is being viewed 20 years from now, it's going to still be a problem. Unless something drastic happens, it's going to still be a problem. To me, this is the biggest problem right now in the entire field of education. It permits us to have a huge variety of things going on there, but it also makes us totally ignorant practically of what it is that's making a difference in different contexts. Because of the internet and a whole lot of things, the, what you have available, what you can get access to quickly is amazing, the volume of it. I would like to be convinced, however, that that has led people to be more open to a variety of ideas and sources and, uh, and, and content. I think the reverse has happened. Look what's happened to education. Hundreds of different journals. Well, it's great we got a lot of journals, is it? No, thank you, because what happens is journals now define little small groups who only communicate with each other. There's a journal now that just deals with a certain approach to online screen design. I will not name the journal. And the people who are publishing in that journal and who do that research have no idea what anybody outside of that little narrow group is doing. This is what they call siloing, but, and maybe it's a reaction to having too much information available. I don't think so. I just think we're permitting people to be narrow and shallow and so on, and not think that history is important, which it always is. Like design, like this field that a lot of us are in, you call instructional design, it's the, it's, it's the plan that you make, it's, the, it's the, the, the sequence that you go through that's more important than the technology that you have available, or even the ideas. If you don't plan to be open-minded, if you don't plan to look at a lot of different alternatives, if you don't plan to be interdisciplinary in the way that you approach a problem, you deserve the narrow, siloed, shallow conclusion that you reach. On an individual basis, that's, not, that's damaging. But on a social basis, it's destructive. And that's my big concern. So we've done great at making a lot of information available instantly and economically available. I am overwhelmed with it. I think it's absolutely terrific. 
but we have not done great in preparing ourselves for how to do it in such a way that we get benefit from it as opposed to the people that are selling it to us.